Um, so uh, this thesis is entitled uh, First Steps in Synthetic Tape Computability, the Objective Meta Theory of Cubicle Type Theory. Um, before I begin, um, I want to say that I dedicate this thesis to my mother, Leanne, who's uh, stood by me uh, no matter what kind of trouble I got myself into. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge some of the uh, uh, some but not all of the personal and scientific debts that I owe. Uh, first of all, Bob's exuberance and forceful advocacy of the unity of mathematics and computer programming is what inspired me several years ago to switch fields and become a computer scientist. Bob gave me an amazing opportunity in his group and it changed my life forever. Bob's well known to have strong opinions as am I, and what he taught me is to find the right thing and then to fight for it. Anyway, it's been a great honor to spend the last five years on the battlefield with you, Bob. Thanks. I also want to acknowledge Steve Audi. Uh, through his influence and efforts, Steve has ensured that the important lessons of category theory and topos theory are not forgotten, even in times and places where they've fallen out of fashion or favor. It was from the courses and the seminars and the fruitful scientific environment fostered by Steve and the rest of the hot team here that I learned many of the ideas and perspectives that made this dissertation possible. I'm deeply grateful to Lars Birkel for his guidance, as well as the respect and empathy that he showed to a young researcher who clearly had a lot to learn. I couldn't be happier to have you on my committee and to spend the next two years working with you in Aarhus. I also want to acknowledge the pervasive influence on my work um, of Thierry Cocon and his ideas. This dissertation is in essence a product of Thierry's expository work on type theory and normalization, syntactic perspective on gluing, uh, and so on. And I have to thank my collaborators, Carlo and Julie and Daniel Gretzer for their comradeship and scientific partnership for the past several years. And finally, I thank my partner, Tamira, for her love and support. You mean everything to me. The dependent type theory is a lot of things to a lot of people. It's a language for doing math. And nowadays, it's also a language for doing homotopical math. Uh, from almost the beginning of the development of modern dependent type theory, it has also been uh, uh, an influential strain that it is a programming language. And because the type structure is so powerful, it is also a program logic, uh, it's language that you can use to write a program and also to write the proof that the program does what you wanted it to do. And another important strain that I've made a great deal of use of is uh, the view of type theory as a meta language for defining the syntax of programming languages and other type theories. Type theory can also be used as a meta language for the semantics of programming languages. You can do abstract denotational semantics interpreting into the type theory of a given category. So all of these different applications of type theory enforce different requirements on the type theories uh, that they use. Uh, on the one hand, semantic requirements, which are the ones that, these are properties that have to hold of all the models of the given type theory. And then there are syntactic properties, which are very special, specialized properties that hold specifically of the syntactic model. On the semantic side, one might ask for function extensionality, uh, the um, presence of effective quotients, or the unique choice principle, the constructive principle that uh, the uh, functional relations um, determine functions. And nowadays people are also asking for uh, type extensionality, that is um, this univalence principle of Vygotsky that types are equal just when they are isomorphic. On the syntactic side, we look for consistency. You can't prove false, things like that. Closed term computation, the ability to actually take a term from the language and run it like a program. And we also look for decidable type checking, which is, as far as I can tell, the most reliable way to implement uh, type theory and proof of systems. It's important for usability. So um, as far as I can tell, as far as the Swedish philosophy that has guided much of the development of type theory is concerned, it's these three syntactic properties that are the most important. If all you wanna do is use the type theory uh, to write programs, you don't even need it to be consistent. Um, but you do need closed term computation. And um, for practical reasons, like having a type checker, you, you do want decidable type checking. On the other hand, if you 
want to use the type theory as a program logic, depending on how you formalize those programs, you may not need closed term computation, but you do need consistency. And I think you do need function extensionality. Moving uh, even further out to formalize general mathematics, I feel that you basically can't get off the ground unless you have effective quotients uh, and the unique choice principle. And uh, if we're doing homotopical mathematics, it's very helpful also to have uh, the univalence principle. So the thing is that right now we basically want to have a type theory that we can use for all that stuff. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that our conventional designs for proof assistance and the type theories that underlie them, uh, we're not uh, able to satisfactorily meet all of those requirements. Um, just to give some examples, uh, new Pearl is an example of a type theory that on the bright side, um, uh, they have function extensionality and a computational interpretation of closed terms. But because it's very tightly tied to a semantics and partial equivalence re uh, relations, it's not compatible with having effective quotients. So it's difficult to use it um, to do mathematics, uh, except by encoding setoids inside the type theory, which is what people do in practice. Um, another issue um, is that the use of equality reflection defeats um, uh, any effort to make a, a type checker. Um, Koch and Lean have uh, different issues as far as I'm concerned. Um, so they, their design involves a separate universe of propositions, which is very good for some aspects. For instance, you can add axioms to, to the prop universe without disrupting the extraction of running programs from Koch and Lean code. So that's really nice. Unfortunately, the thing that makes that work is that prop is so deeply sequestered um, that you end up being able to, um, uh, unable to maintain computation at the same time as supporting the unique choice principle, which is important for mathematics. Um, all the systems that are based on intentional type theory uh, have uh, the difficulty that the built-in identity types do not derive the function extensionality principle, which makes it difficult to use for mathematics without an encoding like setoids or something like that. And then finally, all of these systems were designed with uh, one dimensional equality in mind, um, which does not extend in a smooth syntactic property preserving way uh, to having things like univalence. So um, this set the stage for a many year effort um, in the type theoretic community to design type theories that could handle all these things um, without making compromises. Um, homotopy type theory satisfies the semantic goals that I outline, but it is not a programming language. The presence of axioms prevent things from actually being run as programs. So cubicle type theory was designed um, by the community, and you can see some of the names responsible for this, um, in an effort to have a type theory that uh, has the good semantic properties of homotopy type theory, but the very good syntactic properties of Martin Luff type theory. Um, so we seem to have had some success. Um, both the Red TT proof assistant developed by the team here, um, as well as Cubicle Agda, um, were conjectured uh, to meet all the requirements, modulo like bugs or things that are known not to make sense and so on. Um, and the contribution of this dissertation is to actually prove that the type theories underlying both Red TT and Cubicle Agda uh, have decidable type checking, the strongest of the syntactical properties um, uh, that I mentioned before. <clears throat> um, so the main ingredient for carrying this out is a new technique that I call synthetic tape computability or STC, which is an abstraction of Artin Bluing and logical relations arguments. So what actually is cubicle type theory, because that's what this is nominally about, it's just motion lift type theory extended by an interval and some other machinery that pertains to the interval. An interval is just a new sort that has it uh, where you can have variables of that sort, and it has two constants called the endpoints, zero and one. And there may be other operations, but you don't have like a case analysis principle or anything like that. Um, the purpose of the interval is to give rise to a new way to think about equality. Rather than having an identity type or something like that, instead we say that two elements, say A0 and A1 of type A, are identified when you can define a function from the interval into A that on the left endpoint gives A naught and on the right endpoint gives A1. Uh, because there's no case analysis principle for the interval, um, this uh, can have non-trivial material in between the zero and the one. So the benefit of this approach to um, defining identifications is that it sort of automatically supports function extensionality 
And um, with some effort, you can see that it also supports type extensionality and effective quotients, just like HOD. Um, but it has the benefit of having much stronger syntactical or computational properties than HOT. Um, the first uh, computational um, property of cubicle type theory that was developed um, is the cubicle canonicity result, which uh, basically says that if you have a closed n cube of Booleans, and what I mean by an n cube is a term that has n free variables of interval sort, if you have a closed n cube of Booleans, then it's either constantly the true Boolean or it's the false Boolean. Um, this theorem, uh, which uh, was developed for two different variants of cubicle type theory um, independently, um, for the De Morgan variant by Huber and for the Cartesian vari variant by Andrew Pavonia and Harper, um, this theorem justifies the view of cubicle type theory as a programming language. The thing is, however, that um, for implementation, like the ability to have a real proof assistant, computation of closed n cubes is not enough. You need to be able to compute arbitrary shapes that are um, uh, where the shapes are governed by context that have arbitrary variables, x colon a, y colon b. So in other words, you need to be able to compute open terms, which is often called normalization. That's a much harder result. Um, and that's uh, what I proved in this dissertation. Um, so indeed, uh, the normalization theorem is a little bit difficult to state um, because you have to unfold uh, what is meant by a lot of words like normal form and so on, but I'll say it. Uh, there is a computational function assigning to every type and every term a unique normal form. Thankfully, there are two very important corollaries of normalization that are easy to state. Um, one is the decidability of judgmental equality. Um, it's decidable whether or not two types are judgmentally equal. It's also decidable whether or not two elements are judgmentally equal in the syntax. And um, another very important uh, property that lies um, is essentially the cornerstone of type checking algorithms is the injectivity of type constructors in the syntax. For instance, if uh, pi a b is equal to pi a prime b prime, then a and a prime were already equal and so would b and b prime. Uh, and these, these follow from normalization plus a few other little um, inductive arguments. Uh, so the preliminary result for this, um, for cubicle type theory without universes um, was proved by uh, Carlo and Julie and myself, and we published that in Wix 21. Um, and uh, in my dissertation, I extend that result to cubicle type theory with a countable uh, hierarchy of cumulative univalent universes. <clears throat> Um, so moving on to synthetic tape computability, um, uh, before we get to the synthetic part, I'd want to say a little bit about Tate's method of computability period. So this comes from uh, Tate's famous paper of 1967. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Tate computability has remained the only uh, tool for proving meta theorems of this kind that scales up to arbitrarily complex situations. Uh, Genson cut elimination is a very beautiful tool that proceeds by a more direct inductive argument on derivations, um, but we have had a lot of difficulty applying it to more complex type theories. Uh, so tape computability seems like a good, uh, good direction to go for the foreseeable future. Um, the basic idea is that you interpret, you define an interpretation of the language where every type gets interpreted by some kind of a predicate on the elements of that type. And then you interpret the terms by proving that a term in a given context preserves the predicates, meaning that it takes some, it takes elements that uh, have the domain predicate and returns elements that have the codomain predicate. And the way that you do one of these arguments to prove a specific theorem is that, well, you choose the predicate at the base type to, uh, so that when you prove the soundness of the um, interpretation that implies the meta theorem you're trying to prove. And then all the rest of the types are kind of determined in some mysterious way. So just as an example, um, conventionally, we have um, been implementing tape computability uh, by means of operational semantics. You take your, some presentation of the raw terms of your language, uh, perhaps um, uh, taken up to alpha equivalents, perhaps, and define a transition system on them. And then you uh, define a tape computability interpretation of the types of that language that uses that transition system. So for instance, we might, uh, if we wanted to prove canonicity that every Boolean is either true or false, we would interpret the Booleans um, by the predicate on 
a Boolean B that it computes to true or it computes to false. And then this gets lifted pointwise um, at uh, type constructors. Such an interpretation gives rise to several questions, however. Given a type A, what actually is the domain of the computability predicate? Is it the closed terms of type A? Is it the open terms of type A? Are those terms actually having to be well typed or not? Um, moreover, suppose that the terms were open terms that it was ranging over. Does the predicate have to be stable under substitutions? Maybe only under some substitutions? Since we're using operational semantics, we would also ask if the predicate has to be stable under head expansions. Um, furthermore, bigger question is how much of the proof actually depended on the chosen transition relation? And then finally, why is it that this is the computability predicate that we assign to the function type? Why didn't we do something else? And in fact, sometimes people do other things and there's a question as to whether they're the same. Um, I would say that none of these questions have satisfactory answers in operational state computability. Um, so every time you do an operational state computability argument, you have to answer questions one and two uh, separately um, in a rather ad hoc way. Um, which is not too much of a problem in simple cases, but what we discovered was that answering those questions for the cubicle version of Tate computability to prove cubicle canonicity was nearly intractable, um, although it was actually carried out um, by a heroic effort um, on one side of the ocean by Huber and on the other side of the ocean by Andrew Favoni and Harper. Um, this quagmire motivated uh, Carlo and Julie, Daniel Rebrezzo and I to pursue an algebraic or gluing based version of Tate computability for cubicle type theory in the style of Cocon's argument for ordinary type theory uh, as suggested by Steve Audi. Um, the basic idea is forget the operational semantics, forget the raw terms, only work with, the, with equivalence classes of type terms, never look inside the equivalence class and then change the computability predicates to be proof relevant make it so that instead of having a computability predicate, you have a computability structure. Um, the surprising outcome, even in the case of cubicle type theory was that all of the difficulties that we had experienced um, before in the operational version simply disappeared. Um, we really couldn't figure out where the hard part went, it just disappeared. Now, what we found is that normalization would still require some fundamentally new ideas, however, um, and that's what this dissertation does. So, Synthetic Tate computability is an abstraction of the algebraic gluing argument um, that I discussed above. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the work of Orton and Pitts on doing like synthetic versions of the denotational semantics of cubicle type theory in a topos. And synthetic Tate computability can be seen as like a similar program, but for synthetic meta theory rather than synthetic semantics. So what actually is synthetic about synthetic tape computability? Um, perhaps some philosophers will correct me on this. Um, and uh, so I, I hope I'm not stepping on any toes, but from my perspective, analytic methods try to explain objects of the, of the domain area in terms of the encoding as something totally different. Like we, we, we think of collections as sets. So we think of spaces as collections of points equipped with uh, some topology um, and so on. Um, and a synthetic method, on the other hand, uh, follows by looking at the concrete, understanding the relationships between those things, and then using those relationships as a definition. We explain the domain objects by simply how they interact with each other. So if you look at like, say, ancient style geometry and analytic view of what's going on, they would emphasize the Cartesian plane, powers of the real numbers and so on. Whereas a synthetic view would emphasize Euclid's postulates that are just abstract statements about what you can do with various kinds of shapes. Um, and uh, our aim with synthetic tape computability has been to provide um, Euclid's postulates for syntactic meta theory in essence, by analyzing the relationships between the concrete objects that occur in logical relations and arcane gluing arguments and abstracting those into a language. Um, in particular, what we do is we, we focus on the relationship between syntax and semantics in, um, in logical relations arguments and reflect those by a pair of modalities. Um, for the experts in the room, these modalities are, um, are open and closed modalities in the sense of topos theory. Um, 
what surprised me was that without really adding much to this language, um, this was expressive enough to, um, to recover and simplify the existing logical relations arguments uh, that I was aware of. But what was more important to me is that this synthetic language gave me a way to express the intuitions that I had such that I could reach a solution to the normalization problem. Um, prior to that, things are just too technical to really substantiate the geometrical intuitions that one has when developing syntactic meta theory. So coming back to this syntax semantics relationship, um, I want to explain how I think about what's going on in, in Tate's method of computability or logical relations. You're taking a syntax of your language and uh, you, what you wanna prove say is that every closed term of Boolean type is either true or false. But the syntax of your language cannot express the fact that say like every closed instance of this Boolean is either true or false. That's not something you can express inside the language. So what we do is we just take that language and immerse it in something much bigger, a language that has um, enough room uh, in which to express something like for every closed instance of this term, uh, it is either true or false. Um, and it turns out that this works a bit better if we forget about predicates and look at proof relevant structures um, uh, instead. Um, this proof relevant logical relation or proof relevant computability structure um, is useful not only for giving a simplified account of the logical relations for universes and strong sums, it's also needed even to express the notion of a normal form over an equivalence class of such terms. So for example, in this language, um, we could write down the computability structure for the Boolean. So now I'm gonna write uh, syntactic stuff in blue and then semantic stuff in magenta. So the computability structure for the Booleans is then a dependent sum. It's a syntactic Boolean that is equipped semantically with the semantic fact that either that Boolean is true or it's false. So we wrap that in the magenta to express that that is we're, we're saying that at the semantic level. And these these syntax and semantics blobs are not just a depiction, they are actually logical modalities. Um, and uh, by analyzing very carefully the structure of computability arguments, uh, you can um, see that they must follow some laws. You can mix and match and nest them, but they behave in a certain way. First of all, they're lex idempotent monads, um, uh, which basically means that they commute with equality and they are idempotent monads. Um, the next important property is that um, something that is in the semantic world is syntactically trivial. So if you take the syntactic part of a semantic thing by putting the red thing inside the blue thing, it becomes a unit uh, or a singleton, um, but not the other way around. And then the next important property is that any computability structure can be split into its syntactic part, its semantic part, and then the semantic part of its syntactic part. And you can reconstruct the original computability structure by gluing those things together. You, um, you take a piece of syntax, you take a piece of semantics, and you make sure that they agree on the, on the place where syntax and semantics meet. And that uniquely determines an element of uh, the original computability structure. Um, so to put it crudely, synthetic Tate computability is just type theory plus these modalities. Um, turns out uh, that you can um, express this much more succinctly by taking type theory plus a single abstract proposition. And then you can define the syntax and semantic modalities in terms of that, um, one by exponentiation and then the other by join. Um, and uh, another way to look at synthetic Tate computability that um, has been my preferred way to think of it is that it is the internal language of topoi that are formed by gluing. So to um, get a better intuition for what's going on when we define computability structures when we're doing a computability argument, um, let's have a look again at the computability structure of the Booleans. So it's a syntactic Boolean together with the semantic fact that it's either true or false. The fact that X is true um, in here is in blue because it's a, it, the, um, uh, because the equation between syntactic things is a self-syntactic notion, but the outer part is in magenta. So 
um, the first thing that's important to check to make sure that you actually are able to apply the induction principle of the language at the end of the day to prove the canonicity theorem is to check that the syntactic part of the computability structure that you assign to the Booleans is actually the syntactic Booleans. So we'll check that here using the uh, dynamics of the modalities. So we wrap everything in the syntactic modality. So here, then because the um, syntactic modality is a lex idempotent modality, it commutes with the dependent sum and it's idempotent. So you just have bool here. And then on the right side, we have syntax, semantics. But the syntactic part of a semantic thing is trivial. We already noted that, so this is times unit, but that's of course just the syntactic booleans. And um, these logical relations arguments uh, that we're used to doing basically follow in two steps. First, we choose these definitions, and then we check that those definitions satisfy this property that they reduce to the syntactic part that we want under the modality. So that's about as much as I'm going to say about how you use synthetic computability. Um, um, but my takeaway for you would be that it is a language in which you can talk about syntax and semantics at the same time and carefully glue them together in a way that you don't get redundancies of information um, and allows you to use the induction principle of a theory to prove uh, the theorem that you want. So now I wanna talk um, about uh, the specifics of um, the cubicle result. Um, so before I get there, we need to talk a little bit about um, the computation part of computability. So when we're doing a computability argument, we're basically trying to say that um, this language, which is defined as a theory, has a computational interpretation in the sense that you can take some term that's up to some complicated notion of judgmental equality and make some kind of an observation about it. Maybe the observation that it's true or false or something like that. So we have to um, specify uh, when we do such an argument, what are the elements that we're computing? What kind of observations are we making about them? And in what contexts are we actually doing those observations? So in a canonicity argument, we're basically only looking at the elements of base type, so maybe the natural numbers or the Booleans. In a normalization argument, we're concerned with all types. In a canonicity argument, we are observing a numeral that a natural number term computes to. Um, and in a normalization argument, we're observing a beta either uh, normal form that an element of any type computes to. And as for the context, for an ordinary canonicity result, we're only looking at the empty context. For a cubical canonicity result, we're looking at contexts that are formed by sequences of variables of interval sort, but nothing else. And for a normalization result, we're actually looking at all the contexts. So, in addition to saying what the contexts are, we also have to say under what kinds of um, uh, what kinds of stability properties we expect for the observations with respect to the context. This comes back to question number two that I asked about tape computability. If you're looking at open terms, what substitutions are your logical relations closed under? If we look at an example of normalization, you could consider the normal form of a variable of type nat, and that would just be the variable itself. And we could consider a substitution that substitutes some complicated thing for that variable, say the ninth Fibonacci number. So the element that we're computing is now Fib9 and we're trying to find its normal form, but it's unclear how we would get from the original observation that we made, the normal form of the variable to the ninth actual Fibonacci number. Um, in order to do so, we would have to do a whole new computation, but that's as strong as proving normalization. Uh, so it's unclear what to do there. So um, the lesson here is that neutral observations um, for ordinary type theory, that is uh, normal forms that are blocked on an elimination form that's blocked on a variable, basically. So um, say for variable, some applied to some operations or something like that. These are gonna be closed under renaming of variables, but not full substitution. So what we're gonna to do to solve this problem is just make it so you can't substitute this in the, um, in the logical relation. So um, an ordinary normalization argument, um, more abstractly, we would say that it takes place over the category of contexts and not substitutions, but contexts and some class of renamings, maybe weakening, swapping, contraction, something like that. There's a lot of possible variations that can work there. So, 
the thing is that this approach to solving the difficulty with the instability of uh, normalization under various um, kinds of morphisms does not really work for cubicle type theory. Um, in particular, because, uh, because of the behavior of the interval and the path type. So we already talked about the um, uh, cubicle notion of identification, where uh, an identification, for instance, between the Fibonacci sequence and itself would be given by a function from i into the type of sequences that on the left-hand side returns the Fibonacci sequence, and it does so as well on the right-hand side. So we can consider a context that has such an identification as well as a variable of interval sort. And then we could wonder what the normal form of that path applied to that variable, applied to the number nine is. And the normal form is pretty obvious. It's the application, it's just a long form notation. It doesn't really matter. It's the application of P to I and to the ninth um, piano number. So, the thing, however, is what would happen if we were to substitute zero for i in here and just end up in the context that has only p? So because of the definition of the path type here, what would happen is that this would become equal to the ninth Fibonacci number because the zeroth endpoint of this path is fib. So you apply that to nine, you get fib nine. But again, now we're in a situation where we can't get from here to the normal form of Fib9, so it's unclear what to do. So a good idea based on our experience with ordinary type theory would be to just delete this substitution, just like we deleted other substitutions. Unfortunately, we can't actually do that. Um, for reasons that I really can't get into today, models of cubicle type theory uh, need a special property of the interval, which is that um, exponentiating by the interval commutes with taking colimits, for instance, if you functions from i to a plus b are the same as either functions from i to a or functions from i to b, as an example. Um, this property is very important um, and is, is called tininess um, by some. And uh, removing this uh, substitution from the category of renamings um, would, uh, per, would uh, make it unclear how to obtain a tiny interval in the computability model. So that's kind of a non-starter, at least um, as far as we could tell. So we dealt with this problem in a different way. Um, so just to summarize where we're at, first of all, we know that neutrals, neutral observations need to have a cubicle substitution action because that's what it means for zero and one to be included in the base category of the Kripke logical relations or the computability structures or whatever. Um, and that's forced by, um, uh, or at least uh, strongly suggested by the tininess of the interval. Um, the problem is that we already saw that a neutral observation like that application of p to i to nine is uh, that can cease being a neutral term when you substitute zero for i. Um, so I would say that positive neutrality is no longer a, um, a cubicle notion in this sense, because when you do a substitution, it can stop being neutral and you might need to compute it, whatever that means. So. The thing that uh, the thing I realized, uh, however, and this is really the insight that was provided by um, understanding um, Artin gluing in a geometrical way, was that while the conditions where something is neutral are not uh, expressible in the cubicle language, the conditions away from which something is neutral are. Um, so, in particular, the way I want to um, state this is to say that. Um, uh, if I have a neutral term E, I, I'm going to write boundary of E for what I call the frontier of instability, which is basically a region of space where the neutral term E would cease to be neutral. It would cease to carry information. And we can define this by recursion on the neutral forms. For things that come from ordinary type theory, the frontier of instability is nowhere. So for a variable, variables never, nothing ever happens to variables. You can substitute zero for I and so on, but if it's a variable of type A, that doesn't cause anything bad to happen, so it's fine. Function applications and product projections simply just preserve the frontiers of instability of the um, head neutral form. Where something interesting starts to happen is when we do something cubical. For instance, a path application, if we have a neutral path E and we apply it to an interval term R, well, it's going to destabilize whenever R is zero or one. It will destabilize on the boundary of the dimension R. 
Um, and then of course, we also carry forward the frontier of instability of the neutral pass. Um, so one way to formulate this um, more precisely is to define um, ne the neutrals of a given type, not as neutrals of type A, but neutrals of type A away from phi, where phi is some region or proposition. Um, and do it in such a way that uh, the syntactic part of the neutrals away from phi is just a, the syntax of A itself. Um, and then you can recover the traditional neutrals, the ones that never destabilize, by setting the frontier of instability to be nowhere. And on the other hand, if the frontier of instability is everywhere, all you have left is the underlying term uh, or underlying equivalence class of terms, I should say. Um, so now it's because we've changed what neutrality means, we also have to change the normalization argument. So I want to go back to um, what has basically been the important technical lemma of almost all normalization arguments since Tate 1967, which is um, uh, what some call saturation. Um, the idea is that the neutral forms are a subset of the computable elements, which are a subset of the normal forms. Um, the main part that you want is that every computable term is a normal form. Uh, and then you end up needing this part in order to close uh, the language under function types. Um, so this is a kind of mysterious thing, but um, uh, it is basically been what has been needed for the past uh, 40 years. Now, we can't in our language literally talk about this being a subset of that because that's not exactly what's going on, but we can modernize it a little bit by saying that we have a map from the computability structure of neutral forms to the comput computability structure of A and one from the computability structure of A to the normal forms. And these are all kind of defined over the syntax of A. So that if we take a neutral form of a given, of a given term, we get a computability witness of that term, not some other term. That's what it means for this to commute. And the um, first map that goes from neutrals to computability witnesses is called reflection uh, often in the um, literature of uh, normalization by evaluation. Um, and the uh, other map here that goes from computability witnesses to normal forms is called reification. And then the pair of maps here, this sequence um, is called saturation, or I like to call it Tate's yoga. Um, and this is the main ingredient to prove a normalization result because you're gonna interpret a term into this model. And so then you'll get something over here and then you'll just project a normal form uh, using the reification map. And then that will give you the normal form of your term. So the problem is that this gets very broken when we start introducing these frontiers of instability. So suppose that we said, okay, well, you need to have a Tate yoga for every single uh, possible frontier of instability say phi, um, we can see that this is not going to work by considering the extreme points of phi. So for instance, if phi is everywhere, that is if the neutral is everywhere unstable, then this becomes equivalent to just having the syntax here. But now we are asking, now for the reflection map, we're asking to have a map from syntax into computability proofs but that's actually as strong as the entire normalization proof. That means that this is not a closure condition that we could expect to use to prove normalization because as soon as you say it, it means that you need normalization to already be true. So we don't have enough data over here on the left to construct this map. So we need to uh, strengthen the hypothesis of Tate reflection. So um, the, the way that I came up with to do that is to simply add more data. So here's the intuition. We started off with a neutral away from phi, meaning that like in the complement of phi in, in space, we have data about the neutral term, but everywhere else we don't know anything. And so what I'm gonna do is just add computability data to the phi region and then stitch those together. Um, so we have neutral away from phi, now I'm going to add computability data in phi. And then I'm gonna stitch those together to make sure that they agree on the boundary between, um, uh, between phi and its negation, um, which uh, there is such a boundary in the geometrical sense, even though in like a logical sense, it's hard to imagine. And then um, uh, by combining these things and taking a pullback, we have what I would call the stabilization 
of the neutrals of type A by the computability of uh, structure of A. So for, in short, you can call this the stabilized neutrals um, uh, at, at the phi frontier of instability. This is actually exactly the ingredient that we need. And it's worth um, thinking a bit uh, more geometrically about what this object actually is. Um, so I like to um, uh, splay out the possible frontiers of instability as a kind of interval between the nowhere frontier of instability and the everywhere frontier of instability. And phi interpolates between those. It lives somewhere on that line. And uh, if we look at what the stabilized neutrals with a nowhere frontier of instability are, we get the conventional neutrals, the ones that never destabilize, the ones that are closed under all the renamings um, and even the cubicle substitutions. On the other hand, if the frontier of instability is everywhere, the stabilized neutrals, um, uh, the neutral part of that gets lost, that destabilizes, and all that's left is the computability data defined on phi. But phi was everywhere, so we actually have pure computability data on this side. Uh, so we can see that the stabilized neutrals is kind of like a, a path drawn from the conventional neutrals to pure computability data. It's an interpolation of the two. Um, and it turns out that um, if we uh, then um, attempt to reconstruct the Tate saturation yoga, but replacing neutrals with stabilized neutrals, um, everything works. Uh, so in particular, we put the stabilized neutrals here and then we adjust the uh, reflection map uh, like that. We leave reification the same. And then we have a, a little bit more complex uh, coherence uh, conditions on all these maps to make sure that they're all agreeing about what terms they're working with. Um, but I won't really get into that. Um, and then uh, we are essentially done. Uh, you can show that every type form of, of cubicle type theory is closed under this uh, stabilized Tate saturation yoga. Um, and then just like in traditional proofs of normalization, um, as you might find in standard literature, um, normalization follows from that. Um, so in particular, um, from the, this uh, stabilized saturation lemma, we obtain the normalization theorem that is there's a computable function assigning to every type and term a unique normal form. And then from that, we obtain the two important um, uh, corollaries. Um, well, these are not strictly corollaries. One has to do an inductive argument on the normal forms to establish um, uh, some of this. Um, and you also have to argue that the language is recursively enumerable. But once you've done that, you have the decidability of equality and you have the injectivity of type constructors. Uh, so these are the main results of my thesis. Um, so, just to kind of stop saying uh, stuff about that now, I just want to um, uh, zoom out a bit and um, look at the big picture. Um, this is a bit bittersweet, I would say, for our community, um, but hopefully more sweet than bitter. Um, uh, my perspective on the story of cubicle type theory was that we were trying to find a computational version of homotopy type theory. There are other motivations too to consider cubicle type theory, of course, but um, this has been one of the overarching goals of the community. Um, and I would say that uh, we can now consider this um, uh, chapter finally closed. Um, I would say the first important development in this process was um, the discovery of a constructive model of cubicle type theory in cubicle sets. In fact, the model actually came before the type theory, um, but uh, maybe a little bit revisionist uh, here. Um, uh, this was carried out for both, um, both the uh, De Morgan and the Cartesian variants of cubicle type theory, um, and it has been an immense uh, team effort. Um, the existence of a constructive model does not imply that there is a computational interpretation, but it certainly suggests it, which was why people tried to do that in the first place. Um, the next result was the computational interpretation of closed n cubes, um, uh, again, um, carried out by the two groups for the different um, uh, versions of cubicle type theory. Um, a very, very, very important result that I want to bring attention to um, that pertains to the application of cubicle type theory to synthetic homotopy theory um, is the existence of a standard model in homotopy types. Um, so the issue is that um, a priori, there's uh, no reason to believe that cubicle type theory um, uh, could be interpreted in such a way that when you prove a theorem of homotopy theory in cubicle type theory, it actually implies something about actual honest to God uh, spaces. 
um, but a very important result um, of Audi, Cavallo, Cocon, Real, and Zotler claimed in 2019 is that um, there is a model of cubicle type theory that's Quillen equivalent to the standard um, simplicial set um, uh, model of spaces. Um, so that basically means that you can use cubicle type theory to do math. Um, and then finally, um, I would say that uh, moving from the closed n cube interpretation, computational interpretation in this dissertation and also the Lix paper um, of Carlo and myself, um, we've developed the computational interpretation of open terms, um, which uh, sort of brings, as far as I'm concerned, the questions about computation um, to a close, at least abstract computation. There are still questions about efficiency, of course, um, but that is certainly something that someone else will have to investigate. Um, as far as cubicle type theory itself is concerned, I think that we need to really focus on finding ways to use it. Um, there are actually a lot of applications that people have explored already, applications to programming and verification, um, uh, applications to denotational semantics, applications to just plain old honest math, as well as applications to synthetic homotopy theory. And if, if we're making the claim that cubicle type theory is good, then I think we need to show that it's actually nice to use it and that you can like, um, that it gives you a way to like formalize new ideas or even old ideas in a better way and so on. Um, so I think that um, I, I really hope that people will uh, continue in these directions and um, especially close to my heart of finding more computer science applications of this stuff. Um, so I, um, I invite people to have a look at the bibliography of my um, uh, defense slides afterward to check out some of these papers, which are super cool. Um, as far as synthetic tape computability is concerned, um, We've uh, done a lot of stuff in a short time. So this has been about the normalization result for cubes, um, but uh, Bob and I have uh, used STC to um, simplify and streamline the uh, parametricity argument for effectful program modules, uh, reducing it really to just uh, like a few pages of, um, uh, I mean, technical in the sense of needing to know some math, but not technical in the sense of needing to check complex computations um, math. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Daniel Gretzer has used SEC to prove normalization for, um, I apologize, but a very complex and difficult um, modal type theory, which uh, to me is a good sign for SEC. Um, and uh, Bob, UA, Harrison, and I have uh, used uh, SEC to both define and um, develop parts of the meta theory of a logical framework in which you can um, uh, verify um, not only the behavior, the input output behavior of computer programs, as well as uh, how much they cost, the complexity. Um, so while I did not really get to talk about it very much in this talk, um, the overarching theme of STC, um, in fact, like even at, at its inception, when Bob and I were um, reinvestigating ML modules um, uh, more than a year ago, um, is that it seems to correspond to the phase distinction in programming languages. That is the relationship between uh, syntax and semantics in the normalization and logical relations proofs is actually formally identical to the relation between static and dynamic code in ML style module languages. Um, and that is not the only um, uh, formal analogy that we have found. Um, for instance, um, in the setting of type refinements, the relationship between computation and specification is the same as that between syntax and semantics or static and dynamics. Um, and in the uh, more refined setting of resource analysis that um, Bob and Yue and Harrison and I have been exploring, the relationship between the behavior of a program and its complexity um, is, uh, also has the same formal properties. Um, meanwhile, uh, Stephanie and Bob and I have been exploring another analogy um, uh, that uh, allows the language of STC to be used to um, account for security typing and information flow control um, based on a phase distinction between public and classified information. And the benefit of this synthetic tape computability language, especially in its guise where you add an abstract proposition to a type theory to generate these modalities, is that you can have as many of these as you want. In fact, these propositions arrange themselves into a Heiting algebra. Um, which has obvious applications to um, uh, security typing and information flow, um, but also to um, 
uh, other other settings such as proving uh, meta theoretic properties about languages that are already phase separated and so on. Um, so that's about as much as I um, plan to say. So uh, I thank you all for uh, putting up with this uh, somewhat technical presentation. Um, and uh, just as a little guide to um, my dissertation, um, uh, the first three parts of it are, uh, well, the first two parts are really, there's nothing new there. It's just setting notations about type theory and uh, topo and categories and so on. And then the new results um, appear in parts three and four. Synthetic tape computability is um, explained and developed um, starting from a classic ordinary computability argument done in simple terms and then abstracting it um, and developing a synthetic version of the normalization proof for modulus type theory by Thierry Cocon. And then in part four, um, the normalization result for cubicle type theory is developed. Uh, so thanks everyone for paying attention um, and uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, John, for a beautiful talk. So the